that was plenty of introduction. One problem with such a wonderful introduction is that I feel like I can't help but let you down after that, so I, I apologize in advance. Uh, but thank you all for being here, and thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I'm going to talk today about the AG's office uh, case challenging the travel ban executive order and some of the uh, lessons that I think we saw in that case and that hopefully may be helpful uh, to others to share, and including some, some broader ideas about the role of lawyers in our society and what we're capable of and what we are called to do. Uh, but I want to start with one simple lesson that I learned uh, in that case, which is that if you sort of become the public face of a big case like that, you get way more credit than you deserve for your part in the case, uh, because there were so many people, uh, including a lot of people in this room, who contributed to that case in a variety of ways and who deserve credit for their work on it. I couldn't possibly recognize all of them, but I do want to recognize one person who's here, uh, the head of our civil rights unit, Colleen Melody, is here. Yeah. Colleen did at least as much work as I did on that case and got even less sleep, I think, So, um, but has not gotten nearly enough credit. So uh, there are many others I could recognize too, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, broader lessons. Um, I want to start actually with some, uh, if you will indulge me for a little while, uh, life experiences that help, help me as, as think about uh, the issues as we went into that case. So uh, as Ishmael said, I grew, up, I grew up in South Seattle on Beacon Hill, and uh, at the time, not so much anymore. Uh, it was a pretty affordable neighborhood. It was very uh, economically diverse. And uh, my parents both worked in nonprofits for most of my childhood and were constantly reminding me that we had a lot of advantages that other people didn't have, and that because of that, we had an obligation to try to help others. And it wasn't so much financial. I mean, they both worked in nonprofits, as I know many of you do. It's not like we were rich. Uh, but you know, I had two loving parents who had both gone to college. English was their first language, they weren't facing discrimination based on their race or where they were from, and they certainly knew how to navigate you know, the systems. And so when I was in Seattle Public Schools, I had a lot of advantages that a lot of my classmates didn't have. And so uh, I saw that very clear clearly at Franklin when I was on the mock trial team there, as Ishbel was talking about. We had a fantastic coach and teacher, uh, Rick Nagel, sort of a legend. Uh, and he led our, our team to many state championships, including the year that I was a senior in high school. Uh, but I had teammates on that team uh, who, I had one teammate who routinely had to sleep in her car uh, with her family. Uh, I had other teammates who were from all over the world, uh, immigrants, uh, some of whom were undocumented, one of whom had to later leave the country uh, because of his immigration status. And so I saw very early on that, that uh, even from that very smart, very talented, hardworking group of people, uh, many of my teammates didn't even go to college, much less uh, law school. And so I saw very early on that, that you know, people don't always get the chances that they deserve. People don't always get uh, the opportunities that they should. And, uh, and life really can be very unfair. And that's one of the things that I've always loved about being a lawyer is that while we don't, we don't get to necessarily, you know, every case maybe doesn't tackle those issues head on. I'm sure some of you who sue the state regularly think that I never do that um, sort of stuff. But, <laughs> but, um, but we do have an opportunity to impact those issues in terms of access to justice, equal opportunity, and, uh, and to fight for those things. And I'm going to come back to, of course, how that came up in the travel ban case. Um, the next story I want to tell is a lesson that I'm guessing will be familiar to many of you, but it's a lesson I first learned in college. Uh, I went to the University of Washington along with my wife, who I had met in high school. And in part because of our experience in high school, we, uh, we were really concerned about the affordability of the university and of public education. And so we did a lot of work to try to keep tuition affordable and fight for better financial aid programs. And uh, a lot of lobbying in the legislature and creating student advocacy groups and such. And my wife was actually elected student body president on a platform all about trying to keep tuition affordable. And we had a whole lot of success uh, convincing the legislature not to raise tuition too much and to preserve financial aid. But then towards the tail end of her year as student body president, uh, the UW administration and Board of Regents decided to implement uh, so they started talking about this new thing that they called a course fee that all students would have to pay regardless of what courses they were taking. And, uh, and it was basically a, a tuition increase uh, by another name, and it was a way to get around what the legislature, uh, sort of get around the amount the legislature had said that they could raise tuition. And we kept, we thought this was purely illegal, and we told anyone who would listen. We met with the administration and the regents and argued with them about why this was illegal. And, uh, and we kept sort of waiting for someone to step in and tell them, you know, you can't do this, it's illegal. 
and really no one, no one did. And, uh, and it became clear to us eventually that no one was going to stop this thing unless, unless we did. And so we went out and found a lawyer and filed a lawsuit. And um, not exactly what you want to be doing against your university when you're in college, but uh, but um, but we won, and the university had to refund uh, 1.5 million dollars to students, and couldn't charge the fee anymore. And it was an incredible lesson in the idea that you know, sort of regardless of what the law is and what laws are on the books, uh, it doesn't really matter if there's no one there who's willing and able to enforce them. You know, a lot of and this I'm sure seems obvious to all of you who work on these issues and see you know illegal things happen all the time because no one. Uh, because people don't have a lawyer to protect them. But it was a powerful lesson to me as a young person and, uh, and a lesson that I also have seen carried out in a broader way in the AG's office. So when, uh, when I started in this job, uh, soon after Attorney General Ferguson was elected, we had no part of our office that was really dedicated to enforcing our state's civil rights laws. And one of the first things that he did, one of the first big undertakings that he took on was creating our civil rights unit and hiring uh, Colleen to run it which is now a very strong team that's able to take on important civil rights cases around the state that we never would have been able to do before. And certainly many of you, you know, work on those issues and try to help uh, enforce those laws, but I feel like we now are able to protect people who were not necessarily being protected adequately before, and that is a wonderful thing to see. And the last, uh, the last lesson I want to talk about before getting to sort of how this all came together in the travel ban case is actually when I first came back to Seattle, uh, I lived on the East Coast for about seven years and moved back to Seattle in 2010 and went to work at Perkins Coie, uh, you know, largest law, private law firm in the state, based in Seattle. And you know, I didn't really know what to expect. I'd never really worked in a private firm before. I'm sure many of you are a little bit skeptical of, of uh, large law firms like that. And, uh, but I, I actually found it to be a place that was incredibly committed to doing pro bono work and that we were able to do some things by partnering with nonprofits that, that neither the firm nor those nonprofits ever could have done on their own. So just to give some examples, uh, I got to work pro bono on a case for two young boys uh, whose mother had been deported uh, to help them obtain a special immigrant juvenile status. And I never could have done that if not for the support of the firm and also of uh, kids in need of defense, this incredible nonprofit collaboration between big companies and private firms and pro bono lawyers. And if not for their sort of holding my hand every step of the way, I never could have brought that successful case. Uh, we had a case called Stormans uh, that, that was defending some state rules uh, that were designed to make sure pharmacists weren't turning people away uh, based on the pharmacist's own beliefs and, uh, and especially trying to protect people's access to medications and emergency contraceptives. And uh, we worked together with Planned Parenthood and Legal Voice and uh, were able to successfully bring that case along with uh, a number of my colleagues, my future colleagues in the AG's office. And then the last story I just wanted to mention relevant here today, actually we got to work with a great team from the ACLU on a case called Montez versus City of Yakima, uh, challenging the City of Yakima's method of electing uh, its city council. And in 2012, although Yakima had had for some time a sizable Latino population, had never elected a Latino member of its city council. And so we brought a Voting Rights Act case, and, uh, and that case succeeded. And uh, in 2015, under the new, new uh, election system that was implemented, Yakima elected three Latinos for the first time to its city council. So all of those cases were just examples to me of how uh, nonprofits and private law firms could work together in a collaborative way to achieve things, like I said, that, that could not have been achieved by themselves. So, now let me see, you're all probably wondering how in the hell I'm going to tie all this together to the travel ban case, and your guess is as good as mine, but I, I'm, uh, uh, I actually, I do have a plan. Um, I think the travel ban case sort of highlighted all of those lessons in, in, in powerful ways. So first, it was an example of how meaningless the law is if there's no one there to enforce it, right? So when the president signed that executive order late on Friday, January 27th, uh, there, you know, no one had stopped him, right? There were, there were, no one in the administration had stopped him. There were certainly some brave people who tried, uh, like Sally Yates in the Department of Justice, uh, refusing to defend it and getting fired over it. But, uh, but it took effect, right? It took effect immediately, and it immediately started having these devastating consequences of people being separated from their families, uh, students and faculty at our state universities who were stranded overseas, uh, families who were here who'd been waiting for many years to be reunited with loved ones, uh, having those hopes crushed, and, uh, and even just employees at some of our biggest companies being stuck overseas or unable to travel. 
So luckily, our office was in a position to be able to do something about it, in large part because of the, the groundwork that had been laid in the creation of that civil rights unit and the team that we had available to work on it. And also because we had an attorney general in Bob Ferguson who was willing to do something about it and take on this big and um, you know, certainly controversial issue. So uh, he had been out of state until the day before, until the, sorry, he got back on Saturday the 28th and uh, we talked about you know, the possibility of bringing a case challenging the travel ban and the, the hurdles that we would have to overcome. And he pretty quickly made the decision that we should go ahead. And uh, we brought in a team of people from across our office, including uh, Colleen and her, her team and people in my division, people in other divisions. And pretty much everyone just worked all weekend long. You know, we sort of thought every hour mattered, given that people were literally being, you know, turned around and sent back on airplanes. And uh, and it's because of that, because of the ability and willingness to bring that case, that we were able to move so quickly and get everything filed that Monday, the thirtieth, file our motion for TRO and our uh, complaint. It was also an incredible example of how lawyers can collaborate across lines that sometimes. Uh, divide us not only within our office, you know, where we working together across divisions in a way that we don't uh, always do, but you know, so many other lawyers across the state were helping us in a variety of ways, or, or working in other ways to, to on that to address that issue. So you know, there were uh, the Northwest Human Rights Project and the ACLU not only sort of helped our case, but but also brought their own cases uh, challenging the ban and. Lawyers from every walk of life went to the airports to, to try to find people and help people and represent people. Um, big firms not only offered to help with our case, but also wrote amicus briefs uh, on behalf of private clients. And uh, academics, law professors came out of the woodwork to, to offer ideas for us to write amicus briefs. And uh, even in-house counsel at some big companies you know, dropped everything that weekend to get us declarations about the effects on their companies and to help us in other ways. And so, um, so when uh, when Colleen and I were sitting at that council table in Judge Robert's courtroom that Friday, uh, certainly I think we felt a lot of pressure, <laughs> but we also felt like we had the support of the, you know, the, virtually the entire Washington legal community uh, had our back, which was an incredible feeling to know that you know we weren't doing this alone. We had all this help. We were there. We were supported. And of course, it was a much better feeling after Judge Robert ruled for us, uh, and, uh, and we had we had prevailed. And it was when he did that that really that last lesson I think I was driven home of what lawyers can do. I mean, I think we hadn't really had time to think about what was at stake or how big of a difference the case could make. But then when we won, uh, the, you know, the, the letters and emails and such just started pouring in uh, from all over the world about people who were affected. And I just want to quickly read you two, if you'll. Uh, if, you'll, if you don't mind, that, that, that sort of show, I think, the range of how people were affected. So I'm going to start with one uh, that I received from a woman who taught at my elementary school when, when I was a student there. So it says, Dear Noah, just wanted to thank you and express my appreciation for your accomplishment. You probably don't remember me, but I was an English language learner teacher at Kimball when you attended. I'm writing to you from the perspective of someone whose family was greatly affected by another executive order. EO 9066. 75 years ago, my family was uprooted and sent to the horse stalls in Puyallup Fairgrounds, then to Minidoka, Idaho, where I was born in this internment camp. You can see why I'm greatly concerned with what is happening in our country now and why I felt such pride when I saw you in the news. Please keep up the fight. So that was one, obviously, very, very powerful, meaningful letter. Uh, and then I, I got an email. I'm sure Colleen could probably read you from emails that she received and, and uh, Attorney General Ferguson could as well, but this was from an attorney in Washington, D.C. who wrote, uh, Your office's work has literally saved lives. Because of your case, I had many clients, including refugees and sick children, who were able to come to the U.S. after being turned back originally, despite having valid documents. And I want to also thank you on behalf of the Muslim American community, including naturalized Muslim Americans like myself. You all are heroes to us. So... So those, those were just some examples of how the work not only tangibly affected people, but also, I think, just made people feel like someone cared about them and someone was going to stand up to protect their rights, even in what seemed like a very dark time when, um, when, you know, when no one might be willing or able to stand up uh, to protect them. 
Uh, unfortunately, of course, there was not much time to just enjoy those, those wonderful letters and notes because uh, later that same Friday, the, the federal government said that they were going to appeal uh, our, our case and very quickly. And the next day, I had actually committed to uh, be, be a, a judge at a high school debate competition at the University of Washington. And uh, I was pretty exhausted, so you know, I thought a little bit about canceling, but I, I decided not to. I, I went ahead, and uh, Justice Gonzalez was actually there as, as well. I don't know if he's here today, but uh, uh, he was there. And, um, and I'm very glad I did, and not just because that was the first time anyone ever asked to take a selfie with me. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was a novel uh, experience. Uh, uh, but also because there was, there was one team there in particular from Rainier Beach High School where a lot of the students were from... Uh, refugee families or from families from those seven countries. And to hear their stories and to see how much the case meant to them and had impacted them, uh, it, it did more to sort of re-energize me and affirm what we were doing than, uh, than any amount of um, more sleep uh, could ever have done. Uh, of course, later that night, the federal government filed their brief around 9.30 at night, and the Ninth Circuit immediately told us that our response was going to be due the next, the next night. Super Bowl Sunday at midnight, and uh, so we had basically 26 hours to file our brief. And again, I mean that was another example of where it was just an incredible collaboration by the attorneys across our office in working together on that brief and the professional staff to get that done. And um, we got the brief filed. Everyone went home and got some sleep. Uh, the argument, of course, happened on Tuesday. The strangest argument I've ever uh, been involved in. Um, <laughs> by phone, and one of the only things I actually had on my desk during that argument was that letter from my uh, elementary school teacher, just as a reminder of sort of what was at stake. And uh, then that Thursday, we, we, found, we found out that we won, the Ninth Circuit ruled for us, and uh, of course it was after that that the president sent his famous uh, tweet saying, uh, see you in court. <laughs> and that, that was another thing that just made it all worthwhile. <laughs> At the Supreme Court, but, uh, but then they didn't do that. They abandoned their appeal in that case and uh, eventually withdrew that executive order. And, uh, and of course, later issued the second one that we and others challenged and that's now been blocked uh, in, in several cases around the country that are up on appeal. And of course, I'm hoping that those, those all get, uh, that it remains blocked and, uh, and we will soon see. And I'm happy to talk to folks afterwards about, you know, what little I can say about my predictions about that. Um, but in closing, I just want to summarize sort of the, the three big takeaways that I remember from this case and that, that hopefully are at least a little bit helpful for all of you as you think about your work. And, uh, and so the first is that kind of whatever hardships we face as lawyers, and I know that you know, many, of, many of you have certainly overcome much greater hardships than I have, and we, we have tremendous advantages and skills that, that others don't, that we really have an obligation to use. And and especially, I feel like that's especially the case here in Washington because we're just so lucky to have a lot of advantages here that people in a lot of other states don't have. You know, we have incredible legal nonprofits committed to doing uh, this work, and we have a judiciary that's very committed to it, and we have our big law firms and private companies that are very committed to a diverse legal profession and to access to justice. So we just have we have this incredible constellation of things that makes it makes us so lucky to be here. Uh, to be doing this work here, uh, that I feel like we really have an obligation to not only bring righteous cases, but also to be sort of a model for the country of what access to justice can look like. Because many other places, uh, people sitting in rooms like this uh, have much more depressing um, situations in their state and much more depressing sort of leadership of their state to face in tackling these issues. Uh, the second thing, uh, is that, as, as you all will know, and I know I'm preaching to the choir about this, that, that legal rights are meaningless unless, unless we're all there to help enforce them. And I don't, I don't need to convince you of that. I'm not going to harp about that. But I do think this is a particularly important time to remember that because we do have a president right now who has proposed you know, eliminating the Legal Services Corporation, uh, who seems to be targeting uh, some nonprofits like, uh, like NERP and others that are doing incredibly important work, and who also just is sort of attacking the very idea of an independent uh, judicial branch as a check on, on uh, executive power. So it's an incredibly important time to just be mindful of that and to stay committed to uh, doing what we can to make sure people's rights are represented. And then the last thing is just that I think one of the wonderful things 
about this whole conference and the whole idea is that it highlights that we all can accomplish things working together across lines that sometimes divide us that we could not accomplish on our own. And like I said before, I'm confident that a large part of the reason we prevailed in that case was because it wasn't just us in the AD's office. It was it was the, the immigration rights groups and the civil rights groups and the big companies and the academics and all these forces coming together to tell the courts, you know, this is not acceptable, that, that we were able to prevail and to prevail so quickly. So uh, we in the AG's office will continue to be committed to working on issues like this. Hopefully there won't be too many others quite like this that we need to tackle, but you know, if there are, we, we are ready. And uh, it's so wonderful to see all of you here, uh, here who are committed to the same things. Uh, I know I, I don't have a ton of time left, but I'm happy to answer any questions that people have about our case or about, what, uh, about really anything that you like. And I really appreciate your time and attention. Thanks so much.